Hi everybody, um, very warm well, well, welcome to our conference call today. Um, we're recording this for the website, so hopefully you'll be um, entertained for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, it's the 10th of August um, 2020 today for, for information. Um, and on the call, we've got um, four other directors here at Love Day and Partners. Um, there's myself, Alex Cotts, Raphael Bravo French, Good afternoon. Simon Love Day, and Jonathan Briggs. Um, and the call will be led by Toby Ricketts, um, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Margits Investment Management. Um, we've been partners with Margits for a decade now, um, and they produce the research for the bulk of our portfolios across the firm, um, several hundred million of investments, um, and I think the large majority of our clients um, will fall under Margits' advice um, and portfolios. Um, so um, there's a little bit of housekeeping before we start. We need to state that the discussion is for information only and is not intended to constitute individual financial advice. And obviously you need to speak with your individual financial planner um, if you do want that ongoing advice. Um, but we also need to say that any references to past performance might not be repeated and therefore are not necessarily a guide to future performance or returns. So without further ado, um, I'll pass you over to Toby. Um, welcome, Toby, and um, we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks, Alex. Good afternoon. Uh, we've got our, our own notice slide, but I think you've, you've covered that, Alex. So I won't I won't dwell on that. So I'm just starting with a graph to really tell a bit of a story as to, to where we are at the moment. Um, if we just cast our minds back before the start of this year, we, we, we began 2020 fairly optimistic because we'd seen some resolution in the US-China uh, trade wars and Brexit seemed to be slowly moving forward and behind all of that the global economy was growing uh, at a reasonable pace and expected to continue to grow more into this year and of course all of that uh, changed when we started to hear about COVID infections in China which then as we as we all know now uh, we're all too aware of has become a global pandemic initially causing very sharp falls in markets so even gilts fell in value, which we'd normally expect those assets uh, to rise in value in a crisis. But you can see the blue line there is gilts, uh, corporate bonds in red, and then these are the main global markets. So I think for this slide, the, the point to make, which we'll, we'll cover a bit more uh, as we go through, is the UK fell more significantly actually than nearly all of the other, the other markets. So the US was probably uh, the most well insulated, uh, and then followed by Asia, even Europe uh, did quite well. If we go from that red circle, which is the bottom uh, of the market, initially the UK has been the best recovering market. It's just drifted off, off a little bit. That's the grey line and be overtaken by, uh, by Europe. And it, it, there's some reasons for that, uh, which we'll, we'll cover as well. But that, that's essentially where we are. We've seen quite a sharp fall. I think people who may have been uh, concerned and, and, and if there have been any people selling out during those falls, uh, it's, it's been quite costly because we've seen quite a sharp recovery on the other side and in some markets the recovery has already been to a point higher than uh, before the falls occurred in other markets the UK particularly still a little way off the highs but how did we get that bounce back because clearly with a global economic shutdown you know, that has very rapidly reduced output GDP uh, which has an impact on cash flow and profits for businesses uh, and this is essentially what the market was was concerned about initially was uh, falling profits. And the reason we've had a recovery is because the, the response from governments and central banks has essentially been to print money uh, and replace that, that lost revenue. Like clearly, governments and central banks have taken the view that COVID is likely to be temporary. And rather than a risk that hitting the global economy and then creating a downward spiral, they've looked to mitigate the damage by putting, uh, putting cash in. And we saw that really happen for the first time, um, certainly within uh, several generations, after the banking crisis. So the response there when, when banks failed, because it, it turns out a lot of their assets, um, mortgages they lent, weren't going to be recovered. There was about three trillion uh, of quantitative easing, which was governments pushing money into the global economy. And that was over about two years. On this occasion, it's been over 10 trillion. And in the space of little more than three months, so a huge amount of extra money very, very quickly. And that's really what, what took markets off their lows uh, and back into a recovery uh, mode. It's, it's worth mentioning, there was a lot of care taken after the credit crisis. You, you, you might remember that people were worried about inflation. Everybody learns about Germany 
um, uh, and uh, the printing of money there and the hyperinflation. And you do associate inflation with printing money. So global banks were very keen to make sure the money was sort of injected into the muscle, into the gilt market, so it didn't have a, a really a pronounced significant effect on inflation. We've not been so careful this time. Through the furlough system, the money's going directly into people's bank accounts. Through loans to companies, it's the same process. And in the US, <clears throat> they wrote a, essentially wrote a check, helicopter money, a check uh, to, uh, to, to, to most adults. So that's really what we've, we've seen. In, it's almost like the foot on the brake and the accelerator um, at the same time. But if we just look at, <coughs> excuse me, if we just look at COVID, which is really the driver behind this. So um, yeah, I think the lockdowns came very quickly and there was a bit of anxiety as, as a result of those and concern. But we've seen how China's moved out and stayed out of lockdown now for a long time. Europe sort of followed that path. We've seen some flare-ups in other countries, but it feels to us, and I've got some uh, graphs to support this, that we are now coming out of what we hope may be the only wave of COVID, but certainly uh, out of what could turn out to be the first wave of, of COVID. Um, I'll come on to that with a, a couple of slides to illustrate those points. Outside of COVID, we're seeing a bit of change in the US. Donald Trump's um, popularity seems to have uh, fallen quite significantly. And he's always been a very pro-business uh, president. Joe Biden, who's likely, if the polls are to be believed to be elected, uh, not so pro-business. So a bit of a change in the US, uh, perhaps which has been one of the strongest performing markets. And we're hearing a lot more about Brexit now as we get to this, what should be the final deadline at the end of this year. You know, the negotiations are taking place. There doesn't seem to be a great deal of news coming out of those negotiations, which we think that's a reason to be optimistic because you'll, you'll remember that in the past, where there was Brexit negotiations not going so well, both sides were leaking significantly to the press about the, about the other's position. On this occasion, it, it feels as if they are just cracking on with it. And we're, we're, we're optimistic, and I, you know, we'll talk about the UK a bit more later, but we're optimistic that there's likely to be some sort of Brexit resolution rather than this hard Brexit dropping out on uh, World Trade Organization rules. Um, Europe achieved something as well with COVID that it hasn't achieved before. During the credit crisis, Europe really struggled to agree packages to bail out the countries that were in trouble. So we, they became sort of unlovingly referred to as the pigs, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Italy and Greece. And each member or the wealthy members were really reluctant to put their own money into a pot that then funded, out, uh, then funded their neighbours. Uh, and as a result of that, Europe was very slow, uh, one of the slowest economies out of the credit crisis. On this occasion, it took a bit of wrangling, but much faster than ever before, they've agreed a COVID fund, which is essentially just that, the wealthy countries agreeing to fund the, uh, the countries that are in trouble. And the reason that's quite, that's um, a significant development is it, it breaks one of the problems, or it fixes one of the problems Europe's had for some time, which is not really acting as a true union and each member trying to get more out of it than they put in. And I think with Brexit, UK leaving, there's a question mark over the whole European project. And this development has certainly, let's say, put the odds up of, uh, of Europe as a project continuing to survive um, and develop. We, we think it's estimated that economies have learned with social distancing how to recover about 90% of their output. So when the when the first lockdown, the lockdowns came in, output probably fell by 30, 40%. And then there's measures of social distancing and reopening part of the economies and learning how to bring people back to work in a way that, that still reduced the, the level of infection. The, the level of economic output has, has steadily increased. And it, it looks as if at the moment you can run in a COVID world at about 90%. Now that's good enough really, we think, to maintain markets to where they've recovered to, possibly a bit more. But one of the big risks, and we always think of risks as losing money, but there's a risk of a vaccine. Uh, and if, if a vaccine were, were to come through later this year and be effective, then we could have quite a significant jump on, on asset prices. So, and we, we've got a view that you know, the global economy, when pitted against a problem like COVID-19, is very good at innovating solutions and using technology. And the curve is usually exponential. And we, we think we're seeing evidence, uh, particularly on the vaccine side, that that curve is rising in the background. And so some of these solutions are likely to come 
uh, are coming coming forward. So I'll just sort of put some of that graphically. At the moment, we've got the red dot, which is where we think we are. So we're essentially saying we're through the worst of this. But the green dot is where a lot of the reporting is coming from. So companies for the last few weeks have been reporting their Q2 numbers. And unsurprisingly, in a lot of cases, they've been quite bad. In fact, they've either been very good or very bad. And we think, we think there's an easy explanation for that. If you're, if you're a director of a company that's been hurt by COVID, it's very much in your interest to put all of the bad news out now. So any losses you've got on your balance sheet, any problems you've had and they've covered for a little while, you've almost got a free opportunity to put those out there and blame it on COVID. And then as and when you recover, you can take more credit really for the recovery that comes through. So you create a lower hard bottom. But if you're a business where, which the market expects to have done well through COVID, so Apple, Microsoft, what have you, there's pressure on you really to show that you have delivered in this difficult period. So I think those companies are probably squeezing everything out to show the returns uh, that they've made for investors. Whereas the, the, the companies that know they're in trouble, they're almost pushing every bit of bad news they can possibly think of. And you really saw this with the banks. So there was a sell-off in banks, I think it was last week. Banks came through and put huge additional provisions in for uh, bad debts. So these aren't debts that have gone bad, they're just saying, we estimate that because of the economic downturn, these debts are gonna give us problems. And the market sort of initially saw that as quite a negative, but I think there was then a realization, well, if you're a bank, why wouldn't you put that big provision in? Why wouldn't you make that low point as low as, as possible? Uh, and that's really, that's really what we're seeing, sort of two, when, when you have a crisis like this and governments push money in, they can't exactly target the money to where, to where it's been lost. So they, they just, throwing money almost into you know, a very wide arena. So it's not surprising that some people come out of it far better than others, because although the damage is, is more or less uh, uh, filled back in with, the, with this free cash, it's not exactly, the, the cash doesn't hit exactly where the loss occurred. So talking about COVID, uh, when, when China started to report its infections, that was on the graph now that looks as if it hardly ever happened you know very very low levels of infections compared to what we've seen recently then we saw the graph climb up quite significantly uh, as it moved out of china into europe and then into america then we had a bit of a plateau where the us seemed to get on top of it but we now know relaxed its restrictions far too early which led to a further increase in the wave of infections and then it also moved into India and South America, other emerging economies. And we think now we're just seeing, uh, we're just seeing a tip over now of the average. So the blue line there is a seven day average. And it looks as if we're now coming out of, hopefully the only wave, but possibly the first wave. Now, although the infections are rising, which might make us think the first wave is getting worse. I think a lot of press commentary has sort of suggested that. The deaths is what's told you a different picture. So. The number of deaths in March and April, uh, very high, came down and haven't repeated. And it's, we never really know how many people are, are infected with COVID because for every, every one that's tested, there could be three or four in the community, or even 10 or 20 that aren't tested. And with so many people having mild symptoms, it's almost impossible to know really what the true infection numbers were. But when somebody dies of COVID, it's much more likely that that that's recorded accurately. So the, the deaths give you a better feel for the true number of infections. Because on average, there's an estimate that for every COVID death, there's probably 100 or so infections. You know, it's, it's about 1% or a bit below 1%. So if we back tested these figures, we'd see that the number of infections that were successfully identified in March, April were woefully low compared to the actual number that existed. And so as we're seeing the deaths not climb back up again, I think this is really the the evidence that we're coming, we're coming out of this first wave now. Putting that another way is looking at how many people you have to test to find one case. So if, you, if you're testing 100 people to find one case, it's very likely that you're finding most of the cases. And, that's, and you can see all the European countries are really in this, uh, in this zone where the one or 2% are coming back tested positively. So this is the, the number of cases versus the number of tests. But you can see the hotspots, Panama, Mexico, Colombia, and that's the US up there. Now the US has dropped now just below 10%. So it was running at 12, 14%. Now it's dropped to about eight. 
And what we can see is as countries get on top of their testing program, this is the best way to control the virus. So when, when they've got wide scale testing, they're very likely to, uh, to maintain the control so that they don't have to come um, out, back into a lockdown situation. Something the OECD said, which I think is fairly obvious, is if we don't get a second lockdown, we'll get a V-shaped recovery. If we do get a second lockdown, a W-shape. And so we've, we're very much positioned on the side of the V-shape recovery. We don't know how steep the V is going to be, but to us, the risks, just generally, the risks of not being invested seem higher than the risks of, of being invested. So although it's possible a second lockdown, it seems for all the data that we've shown uh, and more besides, it just seems the less likely outcome. But I think something that, that has been happening is the, the UK market uh, has been underperforming and compared to the US market, which has just had a you know, huge tear really of, of returns pretty much over the last five years. And you know, I think it's, it's, it's reasonable that investors are wondering a little bit about that. And the, the best way to explain it actually is that the, what, what seems to be strong performance from the US isn't broad across the US market. In fact, the US market has struggled to perform nearly as much as the, the UK in certain areas. So what I've got here is the, this is the Russell 1000. So this is a uh, thousand large companies in the States and it's broken down into two halves, the growth, the growth half and the value half. So growth stocks generally are ones that maybe aren't that profitable today, but everybody's really confident or certainly the directors are confident that they're going to be more profitable in the future. A value company is an established business. Its profit is fairly predictable. Uh, so it might pay a dividend for instance, but you're not expecting huge levels of, of, of growth. But they also tend to be less risky because it's an established model. And you go through periods where growth is dominating or value is dominating. And so you can see in O2, uh, value was performing strongly, but you can see you've had this huge underperformance of value now nearly to 2008 and differential of value stocks these are all the US companies to growth stocks is never been wider and the last time it was nearly this wide was during the technology crisis uh, just prior to the technology crash in in 2000 so we've seen a, a real divergence of these two markets and it just so happens I've just added on another line there so it just so happens that the FTSE in the UK is primarily a value market so if, this, if you're holding the same stocks in the US as the sort of stocks you hold in the UK, you've actually had the same performance. But the US has some extreme, you know, very big, in fact, we, we come on to it, but just the size of these tech companies that now dominate the index, that when value, when growth's doing well, the US as a market really benefits from that, more so than even Europe or, or Asia. And although the scales are slightly different, the green line, you can just see that when value is in the ascendancy, the UK does very well. In fact. It, it probably has a, a slight acceleration effect. As values underperform, that's, that's also dragged the, the UK market down, just relative to the Russell 1000, it's a relative growth. And I think when, when you get these sort of disparities, you just wonder you know, is how efficient the markets. You know, we always think of markets as full of investors who are doing lots of analysis and between them, seeing things differently, but working out between them through barter, what's the right price of the company? And in a perfect market, the price that is on the screen would reflect everything that's known about the business and it would be a fair reflection of, of what that business might deliver in the future. But unfortunately, markets aren't always efficient. So you get, you get periods where there's capital allocated. A great example, three years ago, Argentina issued a bond for a years, so they borrowed money. Argentina's country only ever repaid 20% of its debt. So if you're in a level of Argentina for 100 years, your likelihood of getting repaid that money historically is quite low. But because there's been desperation for yield, investors actually offered to buy three times more than Argentina wanted to issue. Within two years, Argentina was uh, back in default and most of those investors lost 50, 60% of their money. So they weren't the sort of smart investors that we like to think about. But I think there's a more recent example. So this is Wirecard. This is a German stock. It's in the trendy, you know, the hot part of the market. It's a technology business, but it's financial technology. We'll call it FinTech. And there was information in the market put forward by the FT that this company had misappropriated about 2 billion euros. So a lot, a lot of money. And as I put on the slide here, just what was known and when. 
but even though this information was in the marketplace, the enthusiasm of investors was such that it continued to be in the equivalent, the DAX, which is the equivalent of the FTSE 100 in Germany, all the way until they finally admitted that they weren't able to find this money. And so when you've got these sort of, sort of events occurring, it just leads us to wonder whether markets are efficiently pricing or whether there's a bit of enthusiasm, um, uh, people becoming a bit too enthusiastic and getting carried away. And I've just inset here Tesla, which is a stock that's had an incredible run recently. And you just, you just wonder whether this is indicative of some o overly enthusiastic investors. With, when we talk about share prices, it's really easy to get a good business confused with a good investment. So with, well, our view would be Tesla is a good business. But when we look at it already being the most expensive by valuation car company in the world, you think it's got to grow into that valuation from where it is at the moment. So um, you know, just because we, we might like a company, we might buy their product, it doesn't mean necessarily that that adds up to be a good investment because we've always got to look at what price are we paying. So I thought I'd just show a time in history where this type of um, environment existed before. So the, the UK had a very good run in the 80s. It was almost like the equivalent of where the US has been. And the FTSE 100 then moved from about 1,000 on the index to, what do we see, nearly 7,000 at the peak. And towards the end of this run, um, it became very uh, concentrated. So the one stock uh, that was the biggest in the FTSE 100 index was Vodafone at 12% of the index. And we can see that you know, that enthusiasm turned out not to be well-placed and the market then fell as technology shares um, uh, crashed by 50%, what we would call a bear market. Now, what's really unusual is normally when we have a bear market, you nearly, nearly always get a recession. So company earnings either fall or something happens where you think they, they're likely to fall and the stock prices then um, fall in anticipation that those profits will deteriorate. But if I just put a graph on of UK domestic GDP, gross domestic product, what you see is that GDP rose consistently all the way through the 90s. So this was simply a case of investors getting overexcited about the prospects for a business. The business couldn't deal on, deliver on those uh, expectations. The share price fell, but the actual economy, which is the engine that drives uh, really investment returns, uh, there was no issue with that. So a very unusual period. And, uh, and I've just put the stock on Vodafone so you can see I think if you just look at the blue line, essentially if, if markets were efficient, that's what should have happened. Some, somewhere in that blue line is where share prices should have stayed. But because there was so much enthusiasm for what Vodafone could do, uh, actually the share price doubled and doubled again before eventually having uh, to correct. And what's, this might not surprise you actually that when you get a share like this, although the people who bought in at the early days are still winners, on average, it's usual that most investors have, have lost money because most investors come into these sorts of stories after the rises. You know, there's, there's something about, with most things in life, the cheaper it gets, the more we want it. So the latest TV, it might be £5,000. As time goes on, they reduce it to three, two. At some point you think, yeah, that's the right price for me. With stocks and shares, for whatever reason, people are more attracted to assets after they've got expensive. And yet we know it's counterintuitive but nevertheless, that's the, that's the, the, the behavioural pattern that, that, that we see. And you can see why Vodafone became really popular because its turnover was just leaping. So this was a, a stock that was just growing its turnover year on year rapidly. And the market just started to think that it could do that forever. You know, that trees could grow to the moon is one of the, one of the phrases we use. And as that turnover matured, it wasn't that the, nothing went wrong with the business. Uh, it just couldn't keep growing its turnover, just ran out of new customers to sell to. So the turnover matured and then the market realized, right, we've got ahead of ourselves here and then mm. you, you've got the correction. And I, I think, we think that whilst history doesn't repeat itself, we definitely think there's some rhyme to history and it, it worries us some of these, some of these top evaluations. And it's worth just remembering, I know Neil Woodford has been in the press a lot recently and it's all for the wrong reasons, um, but he made his career during this period by seeing a lot of these uh, tech stocks were overvalued. He went on the, uh, the value side, which had underperformed. And so during the, the final year or two of the, of the tech bubble and <clears throat> before it burst, you can see that the average income stock, which is more of a value type of fund, uh, outperformed the FTSE. 
and a pure value manager as Neil Woodford was at the time, um, outperformed by you know, considerable margin. So nearly 60% just over a four year period. And I think it's worth us just remembering some of, the, some of these uh, lessons from the past. I don't think they'll apply in exactly the same way now, but I, I still think they're relevant. I just want to how I think we can benefit from them. When, uh, when the buy to let craze sort of began, it really cared because rents were much higher than mortgage financing costs. So people became uh, excited by buying a house, a large mortgage on it, and then getting the tenant in, and it pretty much turned out the rents could pay the, pay the mortgage and leave some change, and you also have some potential for capital appreciation. And we're, in, we're actually in a similar situation, surprisingly, for UK equities. And this is one of our slides, I'm just saying how good value we think the UK market is. So the yield at the moment from the FTSE 100 is just about 5%. And yield on bonds, so i.e. what you have to pay as a government or as an institutional investor, is below 1%. So here's a, here's a position where if you're relatively confident about the future, you could invest in stocks, take the dividends, pay the interest on the loan, and essentially uh, make a profit. And it's really unusual. So normally those lines are the other way around. If we drew this graph back for 50 years, most of the time it'd be the other way around. Because when you, when you lend money, you just get a fixed return. With a stock, just as in the buy to let, you don't just get the, the yield, you also get some a possibility of capital growth and over long periods is very likely. So I think this, you know, these, these graphs tell me or tell us that there's some dislocations in the market and we want to focus on those because we think that's where we can get better returns for investors going forward. And it's worth just, I found this, there's something called the, the, the debt management office uh, and it's, it reports quarterly on all of what, what gilts have been sold by the government and what the yields are. And I found their 90, an edition in 1990 and just looked at the yield. So in those days, if you lent to the government for 20 years, you got 10% per annum, which is you know, a pretty good rate of return. And yet, believe it or not at the time, I don't think gilts were a particularly popular investment, but certainly if we could get those rates now, I don't think anybody would look for much else to put in their portfolio with a government guarantee at 10%. Even index links, which typically yield a bit lower, but they were yielding three and a half over inflation at five, which was the expectation there, so eight and a half percent. And what that tells you is money was really expensive in those days. If you wanted to borrow money as a business, you needed to have a good idea because you've got to get 10% return at, before you can effectively reward yourself. And look how things have changed. So these are the yield curves going back now since about 2015, I think it's the top one. And the yield now on government gilts is only half a percent and when we knock off inflation which is the blue line here inflation is expected to be between two and three percent your people are people are investing money potentially lending money to the government and expecting to get less back in purchasing power than they than they invested so we've always worked on the principle that investors want to grow not just the nominal value of their money it only works if they grow the purchasing value of their money over over time and that, that just isn't happening at the moment with, with gilt yields. And of course, it means that these assets have got, have been going up in value because as the client yield comes down, so from an investor's point of view, I suppose, it's felt good. But it doesn't strike us that people are holding these assets any longer with the intention of, of being there at redemption. So if they're buying a 20 year bond, I don't think they intend to hold it for 20 years. I think they're looking at the momentum of the market and just expecting somebody else to buy it off them in a, in a shorter period um, for more money. And when you get into that position, you just wonder who's gonna be the last person essentially holding, holding these assets. And if we just look back in history, so the, the red line now shows what a bond, if you bought it today, will do over the next 20 years. And the black line shows what inflation did over the last 20 years. And you can see that over time, the level of, inf of inflation erosion on these bonds would have been quite significant, so about 60% over 20 years. And if we would bought one of those high yielding bonds 20 years ago, the actual return from the bond has been pretty good. So you, you beat inflation and had a return on top. But we can see now that the future is going to look very different to the past. And it just, it just feels to us that these, uh, the bond values are, are really quite high. 
and therefore potentially we could see some losses for clients from those and therefore we're avoiding that, that asset class. Now, all, I'm trying to link all these stories together because there's a theme that runs through this. When interest rates are low and yields are low, the stocks that do the best are the growth stocks because a growth business requires a lot of money to be invested up front for a business plan that hopefully matures at a later date. And if you were a bit a growth business borrowing at 10%, as you would have been in the 90s, as, as, I, as I showed, then the, the breaks on your success are quite considerable because you've got to pay that debt back all of the time at, at 10%. But if you can borrow at 1% or a half a percent, well, your equity value looks far more attractive because the bond market is giving you some very inexpensive money for you to run your business plan. And if, if investors start to think it's a good business plan, then all of the profits for that largely are going to go to the investors because the debt is so cheap, especially if the debt is subinflation. And so it links back that because I think yields have come down so much and the US has a high proportion of growth stocks, therefore the US has been a standout investment market over the last, well, that, these are the 10 year numbers, but I think you can really see the breakaway happened about 2013 which coincidentally was the date that the, when initially after the credit crisis, when central banks printed money, it, uh, credit financing still remained quite expensive. The transmission of that into actually being able to borrow cheaply took some years. So around 2013 is when we seen the, the, saw the traction of low interest rates moving into the corporate bond market, and it's really fueled some great returns from, um, from growth stocks. And if I put IAU, the uh, UK oil company sector against the North American index. So this is a relative graph. So I've just made the North America flat. We can see that during the nineties, the UK really underperformed all the way into the tech bubble and then had a, a really strong spell against the US as value outperformed as the, as we saw tech stocks fall away and it's fallen in value quite a bit. Now, actually prior to COVID-19, it looked as if this trend was reversing again and we had quite a lot of confidence that that would occur. But COVID has really played to the, to the growth story because the companies that got hit the hardest were those that are quite capital intensive. You know, people, people, factories and staff, because when you can't work, all of those costs, the airlines, all the people they've got to pay but they can't fly, it very quickly turns a good business model into a bad business model. Whereas the tech companies, first of all, saw their demand rise and they've got quite a low level of, um, of um, capital deployment as well. So just when it looked as if it was turning, COVID's put another, another leg on. But uh, and you can just sort of see that this graph. In fact, I've just taken a much shorter time frame and inset that. So that, that was the COVID uh, hit markets. But actually it's been pretty level ever since. And if we do see, as we think it, there's a good chance of vaccine, then the reversal from growth back to value could be quite, quite significant and, and fairly and, and swift. And therefore, for all of these reasons, we want to hold a very well diversified portfolio that's got exposure to some of the US stocks and those techs, but not, not a huge weighting so that we're still diversified in the other areas that we think are dislocated and could come back quite, uh, could come back quite quickly. Just to put it into context, just with one, one stock really is Apple. So I mentioned that you shouldn't, you've got to be careful with a great business and a great investment. So Apple, it's clearly a great investment, a great business, but the valuation is really huge. So Apple at the moment, one, I think 1.4 trillion. So that's, that's bigger than all of the output of Mexico in any one year. It's bigger than all of the Taiwanese stock exchange. Uh, you can see the other exchanges on there, bigger than Singapore, bigger than Moscow. And so if, if a company's worth one, 1.5 trillion, let's say, and investors want to double their money over the next five years or 10 years, which I think with a stock like, the risks of Apple, that's what you'd be hoping for. You know, the amount of growth that that business needs to find to justify that level of increase, you, when you dominate a market so much, you essentially you run out of, unless the other businesses around you can generate the returns themselves to feed into your customer base, you start to, it becomes, there becomes a point where you, you can no longer, it's a food, food web and Apple can't continue to grow unless the other businesses are growing with them. So when you've got this disparity of lots of companies not doing well and Apple doing well, the shareholders buying Apple are sort of taking the view that the other companies 
around them are also going to recover nicely because if they don't, where will the demand come from, from for Apple's products? We all need, we all rely on each other's trade. And so it, it does have that resonation. It resonates a little bit like Vodafone to me, where you've got this huge valuation for a great business and it's had superb increases in turnover, but the share price expects that to, to be maintained probably for at least another decade. And that's quite a lot to us. And at the same time, if we do start to see yields tick up a, a bit, then that's going to put more pressure on these growth businesses. They've done very well out of cheap borrowing. Um, it does feel that we've seen probably the, the low we can expect for borrowing costs. And the bit that's, that might change that is inflationary pressures building. So with all this printed money and direct to people's pockets, yes, the likelihood of inflation this year or even next year, quite low, but you start to move on beyond that. And you, you can see that that level of stimulus is likely to cause some, some inflation to build. And that's where the pressure comes on, on interest rates. So if I just, I'll just build it all together into our outlook. We, we think COVID-19 risks are, are currently priced in to a higher extent than they need to be. We think there's upside coming from a reduction in COVID-19 risks. We're not reliant on a vaccine, but a vaccine would give a very significant boost to markets. If we don't get a vaccine or not anytime soon, 90% of GDP from most economies is fine, and it will continue to see a uh, fiscal stimulus from governments uh, uh, alongside it. We, we think China set a route where you can get out of COVID and stay out of it. So it's always more dangerous to, to suspect something's gonna happen that we've not seen before, but we've already got data from economies that have been able to manage COVID, and that gives us confidence that if they've been able to achieve it, others will be able to achieve it. Um, we, for the level of stimulus bonds, which have had this great rise over many years, they haven't really had much upside. So normally that insurance policy should have paid out. Okay, it hasn't, they haven't fallen in value, but I think it gives some indication that now yields are so low, your here's an asset class that's going to struggle really to give any, any returns going forward. And it does, we do like equities particularly, but the, the areas of the market that perhaps are unloved to us look like very, if, you, if we're patient, which we're prepared to be, and we buy those assets and they're good quality assets, that's where I think we've got the best chance of, of good returns going forward. And so you know, we're, not, we're not all in on that, but we've got, we've got a reasonable amount of the portfolio weight, portfolio's weighted uh, to, those, to those assets as well. I mean, just back to the point I made during the presentation that investors do tend to be attracted to stocks that have already given their returns. And we have got some of those, of course, because we're diversified, but we're actually attracted to some stocks and areas of the market that haven't given very good returns, but we think we understand what's driven that and we can see the catalyst for, for that to change. So I'll so I hand back to you, Alex, and for any questions. Um, Reference, reference yeah, thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Toby, for a very clear presentation there. One of the phrases that we see used a lot in the industry now is ESG, environmental social governance. And we had a question, uh, if you use any measures, uh, ESG measures, when selecting funds in the markets model portfolios? It's, we do. And although ESG is a term, it's quite new. The, the concepts of ESG have been have been built into good investment strategies for, for a long time. ESG is sort of the, I think, the development of what we used to call ethical funds into something that's, that's broader. So the part of ESG that's always been strong for us and the managers that we work with is governance because businesses that are run by people who are, who are good at running that business are much more likely to give a return and much less likely to cause a risk to clients. Um, so... The social side as well, there's a increasingly managers that we use and we always, um, as we go through our due diligence process, we, we, we want managers to vote on behalf of clients to influence companies. So ESG isn't, it's not a concept where a company is either ESG or it isn't. It's a whole process of if your own companies that aren't behaving very well, you influence their behavior to be better. That's much more effective from an investor's point of view. If you make clear a stock will never be ESG, you actually encourage, could encourage poorer behavior because those companies know that they're not ever going to be included by managers. Therefore, they might as well 
sort of continue to behave badly. So I think the um, the S and G have always been strong, and we we've got a, as much we've got a questionnaire that we go through with every fund that we buy. I think the environment side is just you know, it, it, we want we want to do things that look after the environment. It's harder, and there's lots of different definitions. And so and the managers do talk about how they're but they're, how they're trying to Im- improve the environment through investing. But it's not necessarily avoiding polluting firms. It's about holding those polluting firms better shareholders putting pressure on them just to pollute less, which is much more effective. But it's, it's, it's growing all of the time. So the amount of ESG work and information we, we're getting now than compared to a year ago, it's, it, it's, it's a lot higher. But I think this will move on significantly over the next few years. So I think it's a sort of a work in progress. But it is, it's really been effective because the when there was a move towards ethical funds, it didn't it didn't seem to encourage companies to behave differently. But ESG, it is influ- it influences boards. They're worried. Look at Boohoo. You know, they turned out they were running a, um, you know, I think it's a sweatshop in Leicester, and they weren't treating staff very well. As soon as that information broke, significant drop on the share price. Well, isn't that great? Because it tells everybody in a similar business that you, if you don't keep these standards, then essentially you lose capital being allocated to you so we're part we, i think we're part of that we're part of the community of esg and we'll continue to to develop the, the ideas along those lines excellent thank you toby uh, toby i have had a question um at the start of lockdown back in march i remember you saying that all the governments would have a 90-day race yeah. in terms of getting the economies back up and running to some degree back then and that has proven to be to be the case um, and I know on our weekly conversations with you, you've been saying that governments will try to avoid going to um, a full lockdown again. It may be regional, but, you, but um, in terms of protecting the economy, that was um, really, really uh, what they're trying to avoid doing. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of our conversations with clients at the moment, we're still clients are still understandably nervous of a second wave, um, and although. You said you know a lot of that fear has been costed in, and the governments would try to avoid that lockdown. What um, what potential falls or, or or market behaviour could you see if there was to be a, a serious second wave of, of COVID nineteen approaching the autumn or winter? I think I think you, you could if we saw a second wave. I don't. I think a wave will create volatility because whenever people become anxious, it's markets just reflect human behaviour. I think if it became a, ser- a significant enough way for another economic lockdown, you'd have to you'd have to expect there might be ten or fifteen percent that could come off markets. You know, maybe back in if we take the FTSE as a, 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 to be representative, I think we're just over six at the moment. I suppose you might expect it to go down towards five thousand, but I don't know how long it would stay there because what we know about central banks and governments have moved into a completely different management style since the credit crisis and they respond with printed money to these to, to these uh, when there's a crisis like this and printed money works very well at propping up the value of assets uh, but it could be inflationary so if you're worried about markets then there might be an instinct to go for cash because you've got security of the nominal value but if inflation is one of the risks you're worried about because of the because of the reaction to global banks and, and governments and actually cash can be nearly as dangerous as the risks you're trying to avoid and we 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 said to clients i know it's uncomfortable but to some extent this is a covid casino now we we don't know what's going to happen and there's risks for everybody that can't be mitigated what we can do is build portfolios of good quality assets with diversification which is the best spread of all the possible outcomes but if we do get a second wave I think it's I think it's unlikely we get a lockdown because I don't see any benefit. The lockdown the first time round, if you take the UK as an example, we we didn't we didn't know how to work with COVID. The boards weren't equipped, shops didn't have screens. There was, there was we've had a, a whole economic fit out during that twelve week period to allow us to regain uh, a, a large part of our economic output and manage COVID. So that was that was worth it for that, but. That isn't, you won't get that benefit the next time you lock down. So I think you just keep increasing social distancing measures, but maintain the economy 
um, open. And we're seeing, I mean, there's a few, it's clear people that we, we, we don't know everything about this virus, far from it. It took a long time to work out if face masks were a good thing or not. We, everybody's still learning. But the death rate is coming down. So it looks as if treatments are getting becoming much more effective. It, 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 it may be that the virus is, become, is morphine and becoming less. That's, that's the Italian scientists very keen that that was happening in, in their view. But on the, if we, I know the, the, the press headlines do have you worried from time to time. And they seem, I'm a bit, it's a slight concern of mine with the way the press report things because now we look at news online. If we, a headline needs to get your click for you to read it. And if it induces anxiety, it's much more likely to get the click. And so if you, you know, I want to encourage people to do, if you read the headline if, and then read the article and it says a speech by the WHO, go to the speech because you'll see the speech probably contained a lot of other references that the article didn't. But I'll just tell you one, if you give me that, there was an article, the BBC said, WHO saying no silver bullet for COVID. So it sounded as if they were saying they didn't think that thing would come through. When you read the speech, the WHO said, we're very hopeful. We think it's likely there will be a vaccine, but we they were worried that economies would assume it, stop the social distancing, and maybe the vaccines wouldn't work. So they're saying, for now, you've got to carry on with your social distancing until until the vaccine arrives. So they were saying they were saying there's no vaccine, but they weren't saying we don't think there will never be a vaccine. And it, it's those sorts of articles because when we look at the numbers, you know, we're just going through a natural first wave of COVID. That's how the numbers look, and it's it. It's starting, I think we're starting to push on the other side of it. It's almost certain we'll get another wave until there's a vaccine, if there's a vaccine. But I think our ability to manage COVID is improving all of the time. And, it, and that's why I don't think we get to an economic lockdown. So the, the trigger that you pull for an economic lockdown is only if you're, if you're if the NHS is overwhelmed, then you have to lock down because you've got to, you've got to protect the, the basic services in the, in the economy. But it, when you hear the number of people, even though cases are rising again, there's hardly anybody in hospital with COVID. It's really, you know, the, the hospitals are nowhere near overwhelmed. In fact, they're, they're virtually empty in a lot of, lot of cases. So all of that looks quite promising to us. So we, which I we understand the pessimism, especially with something, a new risk like this one. But we think the data says cautious optimism is the right, is the right stance for us. Oh, yeah, Toby, thank you. Um, reassuring earlier on, you mentioned the fact that when you look at the data uh, uh, now versus back in March when the pandemic was announced, that there's a sort of level of parity or recovery there. So for those clients of a nervous disposition, particularly those who are in our low risk portfolios, low to medium or even medium, We've got quite a bit of exposure to the um, to, to, to the UK or, or, or bias towards the UK. So um, hearing you talk about the, the US and, and describe it as a tear for, for the last few years, I mean, I'm just interested in two things. One, uh, why why that uh, bias towards the UK, and, and then secondly, given uh, how the US is, has been behaving despite the examples of Tesla and, and, and those great comments that you say about. Um, the, the, the sort of uh, efficient markets, you know, do we see that recovery happening? And if so, sort of all that catch up happening? And if so, what sort of time scale? We, we do. And funnily enough, um, if you, when we, Q4 last year, as the news for the UK start, started to turn more positive before COVID, the UK significantly outperformed the US in, in the last quarter. And I think that gives you a glimpse of the sort of level of outperformance that's possible when this trend, when this trend reverses. And we know the trend has to reverse because mean reversion is a, is a law that we can apply. And we know that I showed you that graph where the, the value and growth lines come out. They have to mirror each other because all of the stocks in the index are either growth or value. So if they come out, you know, sure, sure enough, they have to come back together. And we saw in Q4 that we didn't need a if we only saw a small amount of mean reversion, we actually got quite a lot of additional performance out of the portfolio. The, we, like, we, I mean, we like the UK. We're always a bit UK-centric, always have been for low-risk investors because um, by investing in your own currency, it actually reduces the overall risk. It's just that Brexit sort of has disrupted that relationship, but only as a one-off. So I think the idea that UK assets are lower risk generally for UK investors 
for people who reside in the UK, it still holds. But of course, with sterling falling so significantly during Brexit, then actually you wanted to be anything outside of sterling and it, it made money for you because sterling got cheaper. So your dollars or any dollar assets just look, look better. We've seen in the last few weeks actually sterling going the other way. So although the US market has been outperforming the UK market, to a UK investor, they've been about the same because the rise in the value of sterling has offset some of the gain from, from, the, from the, the US performance. If we saw a, a reasonable outcome for Brexit, I think there's quite a lot of upside currency risk. And then I mentioned that UK investors holding UK assets actually reduce their risk. You would see the evidence of that because if we get a good rise in sterling at some point, which I think we would do on a Brexit result, then all those foreign assets might stay the same in dollars, but you're gonna, your valuation is going to go down to reflect the change in, in currency. So we've only really seen one half of Brexit, which has hurt UK assets and worked for overseas assets, but it could have reversed. And it, it is uncomfortable uh, for us as well, I think, as for clients. But it, again, it's one of those risks we just have to accept that the... Um, with, 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 with Brexit, we don't know what's going to happen. We, we, we've said right from the outset, this will be a painful negotiation because these European negotiations always are, but they usually somehow get a deal done at the end. So that's that's our view. And it remains, if, that, if that's right, those UK assets will catch, could catch up quite quickly. So the next few months could see quite a decent catch up. But because they've been, because they're not, not loved and they're not, not momentum trades, in the event we don't get the outcome we're looking for, the downside is quite, it looks to us quite small because the, these assets are already attractive. So the, the amount by which they could fall in a hard Brexit scenario seems quite limited. Thanks, Toby. Okay, thank you. Um, just a question from me now as well. I mean, obviously, there's a huge number of different strategies going on all the time when analysing portfolios. It'd be quite an interesting question would be to know if you could boil it down to what your number one theme or your number one strategy for the for the next year or so is um, and also following on from from Jonathan's question as well you know is there anything that you feel that you haven't got right in the last year or are you right but just early yeah I think well you, you're I think as a fund manager you just can't help but analyze what you wish you'd done differently and we should have we should have held bonds for longer than we did um, and we we would have been better off if we'd held more US assets we with the, if I just start with the bonds, we, we went very heavily into bonds just prior to the credit crisis. We, we had some fear about growth rising exponentially. And I think government bonds were yielding at the time five and a half, six percent for 10 years. So we thought that's, that, how, you know, that's very attractive for low risk investors because inflation, we thought at three, you can get six, three over inflation for a good chunk of the portfolio. And we, we had a really high weighting for years and years and we made really good returns from them so it was one of our one of our best investment ideas when we got to 2015 the yield on these bonds was now below inflation it didn't it really didn't make sense to hold them and so we started reducing those those weightings and we were pretty much out of bonds altogether 18 months later 2017 with yields not far off one and a half percent and they've just gone down to now there's an old expression for long-term for managers make sure you leave 10 percent for the next guy because you to get out of something, you need to sell it to somebody who thinks it can go further. So we probably, we didn't just leave them 10%, turned out we left them all like 20. But it's hard, I know we all look at three year numbers and what have you, but I'm just really proud that we, that was a good investment. We got into an asset that was good value. We held it for a very long time, which we like to do. And we sold out because it was expensive. But it's then gone on for reasons that I don't think anybody could have bought that expecting the level of quantitative easing and then ultimately a COVID crisis and what has been 13 trillion pushed into the global economy. If you bought it without expectation, you know, your, your forecasting abilities would be you know, quite, quite incredible. So and our process is find cheap assets that you like, see a reason that those that value should be released and then wait. That, and that really, you know, it does work. That's really effective. I think we've had to show more patience recently than, than I remember. But I think what's happened within the world economy has also been exceptional. And I, I like it a bit to, you know, I've, I, my children are just growing up now. And when you've got a view that you just know is right, but it's not being rewarded, it's like looking at the children when they're young and you think, when are they going to grow up? You know, it's quite hard work. And then they grow up and you think, where 
why was I even worried? Where did the time go? And it's that sort, you know, I'm definitely, I've got the three-year-olds running around thinking, when are they going to learn to do things for themselves? And I think before we know it, um, you know, the, I feel, as you'd, I think as you'd expect, we think these views are really well argued, argued and implemented. And you can get, performance can come strangely quickly. And you can almost then look at your track record and think, why did, you know, why did we ever worry? Of course we were right. But when you're watching stocks like Tesla quadruple since the beginning of the year, and they, and they don't make a profit, you know, it is dangerous investing in businesses that are worth that amount of money that don't really make a profit, or not any, any real profit compared to their valuation. And you hope that they will get to the point soon enough to make profit for somebody else to buy those shares off you and feel they can get a return out of it. It might happen, but I'd much rather buy a whole collection of unloved UK utilities with yields of 7% and wait for that. And I think I feel much more comfortable you know, without the Elon Musk sort of bet, um, you know, buying those, those businesses that are going to be around. You know, they might have a bad year with earnings for COVID, but it won't destroy them. And when COVID abates, their yields will become very attractive. So I don't, so I think we can't, we did come out of bonds too early, but we got in a long, long time. You know, so investors have been with us a long time, still have done very well out of bonds uh, with us. The US, I think, yeah, we, we didn't really see this spectacular rise. I, I think it was Brexit really. Um, we didn't see the Brexit vote going leave. And if we had, we'd have gone much more for US assets on the sterling depreciation. And so I think Brexit was probably what, what led to us being underweight the, the US, because on a Remain vote, I think you would have been much better with UK assets. Um, and it's been quite tricky ever since because the US has gone on this very sort of momentum looking run that just worries you. Um, but we, for the US being, say, small, yeah, I think it's a small mistake, we've, done, we, we've had good returns from Asia, for instance, which is one of our other views. We thought Asian equities, both inexpensive and much stronger growth rates than the US. So that, I think for now, I couldn't, I couldn't have said anything I said and not say, you know, the UK is where I think the UK market will have a period of very good relative returns. And I'd like it to be soon, but I think for it it doesn't it's one of those things you just got to, the, the maths all add up it's a good strategy and good strategies generally get rewarded but not not always you know as soon as you would like maybe thank you, thank you the, 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 the um the patience in investing is quite interesting i saw something recently was that was quite a good quote in terms of you wouldn't plant a seed um and keep digging that up every few minutes to see if it's grown you, you know you just have patience stick to discipline and keep watering the seeds really but um but um thank you very much for your time today and um and and for the last three to four months i mean we are obviously back in the office now but um there's never been a more important time to keep close to clients in the last four months and um having our weekly zoom calls um virtually with yourself and our whole team here has, has been absolutely invaluable and very insightful and um and very reassuring so we'd like to so thank you very much for your support in the last three and four months. Um, thank you, it's been a pleasure. We sincerely enjoyed working with you and um, it's been excellent. So um, and thank you for your time again today, Toby. So uh, yeah, much appreciated. Thank Thanks, you. Toby. Thanks, Thanks Toby. Toby.